This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And if you don't mind, I'd like to suggest something that you might share with your friends. And that something is a glass of sherry before dinner. Naturally, a glass of Petri California sherry. I say Petri sherry because it's the perfect before dinner wine. You couldn't think of a better way to begin a meal. That Petri sherry has a beautiful and biting color, like, like dark amber. And for flavor, well, you've heard sherry described many times as having a rich, nut-like flavor. But if you want to learn for the first time what those words, rich and nut-like, really mean, you just taste Petri sherry. It's wonderful. Serve Petri sherry by itself or serve it with hors d'oeuvres with those little cocktail sandwiches. And incidentally, if you prefer your sherry dry, you know, not sweet, just ask your wine merchant for Petri pale dry sherry. The important thing to remember is, if you want sherry... You want Petri Sherry, because that means good Sherry. And now let's look in on our genial friend and good host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Thanks to the minute as usual. Never keep a doctor waiting, I always say. Particularly Dr. Watson. <laughs> Throw out the chair, my boy. Thanks. Ah, uh, <laughs> All ready to tell us the Sherlock Holmes adventure of the Speckled Band, Doctor? Yes, I'm all ready, Mr. Bartell. Say, Doctor, just what does the Speckled Band mean? <laughs> Wait till I've told you the story, young fellow, my lad. You'll find out for yourself. <laughs> Sorry. The floor is all yours, Doctor. The adventure of the Speckled Band began on a rainy April morning in 1883. An urgent call from one of my patients had kept me up most of the night before, and in consequence, I came down to my breakfast rather later than usual. To find that Holmes already left our house some hours earlier. As I sat there reading the morning paper and consuming my two lightly boiled eggs, there was a knock on the door. It opened to disclose a typical example of the British working man. A bag of tools in one hand and a grimy cap in the other. I can hear him now as he spoke to me from the doorway. You sent for me, Mr. Holmes? I'm not, Mr. Holmes. I'll bring you a pardon, Governor. I'm cutting him in the gas bracket over the mouthpiece. Oh? Huh? What's wrong with it? I've got a leak in it. A leak? Well, what's well, wrong with your work? Yes, sir. Oh, I'll pop up this you, sir. Oh, no, that's all right, my man. Don't mind me. Very untidy man, Mr. Holmes, sir. What do you mean by that? Well, sir, you can't help noticing the mess this room's in. I've heard say he was as tidy as anyone. He started, but he learned his habits from a, from a bloke what lived with him. Doctor, the doctor wants not his name. You important fellow. How do you talk like that? I've got a good man... Please, before I go. Here. Here, come out of there. That's Mr. Holmes' room. Don't be angry with me, Watson. I was just slipping out of these rimy rags into a dressing gown. Oh, good gracious me. <laughs> so are you, Holmes. Oh, my soul. I've never recognized you, but, but why the disguise? What case, my dear fellow? What case? One of those small problems which a trusting public occasionally confides to my investigation. To the British workman, old chap, all doors are open. Yes. His costume is unauthenticious and his habits are sociable. Tool bag is an excellent passport. And that pony moustache will secure the, <laughs> the cooperation of the maid. Oh, but what's the case, Holmes? Huh? Modest little drama of life in the kitchen. One of those seemingly inconsequential affairs. And yet, the honor of a duchess is at stake. Mm -hmm. Mad world, my master. A mad world. Ah! Now I feel a little more comfortable. Let's return to the sitting room, shall we? And... A strong cup of tea would be acceptable. Oh, she you tell me about the Duchess and life in the kitchen? Another home? time, over mm -hmm. another time. At the moment, suppose you tell me what you know of Miss Helen Stoner. I received a letter from her this morning in which she informed me that she would be calling here at 11 and also that she was a friend of yours. Uh, Helen Stoner? Yes, indeed. A charming girl. Then pour me a cup of tea, Watson, and tell me about her. Well, I befriended her at the time of the tragic death of her sister two years ago. I've told you about the case. Uh, don't you remember? The sudden death of Violet Stoner 
That's an old house in Stoke Moran? Yes, yes, yes. Huh? It's all comes back now. There was an inquest, wasn't there? With a yes, string of stupid and ineffective witnesses. I, I was wrong. Oh, I beg your pardon, old fellow. Then uh, uh, you were the exception, of course. Uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see. I docketed the evidence on the... Where was it? That's Stratford. Oh, yes, here we are. Here we are. Now, let's see. Yes. F. Salisbury, Hatchet, Murder, Lawson, Simon. Ah, here we are. Stoke Moran. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I remember the affair quite well now. The villain of the feast was Dr. Grimsby Roylet, wasn't he? Yes, dreadful fellow. He's a stepfather of the two girls. Violet, the one who died so mysteriously, and Helen, the one who's come here to see you. Uh, Dr. Roylet is a pretty record. Fifty-five years of age, killed in Pitmagan, India, once in an insane asylum, married money, wife died, distinguished surgeon. <laughs> Ah, I wonder what the distinguished surgeon has been up to now. One devil to her, sir. Oh, why do you say that? You remember that Miss Violet Stoner's death followed close upon the announcement of her engagement? Yes, I do. Well, I met Miss Helen Stoner in the street a few weeks ago. She told me that she'd just become engaged herself to a young fellow in the army who was leaving for the Far East. Upset. The thought of being alone with her stepfather at Stoke Moran. Well, that's quite natural. You see, Dr. Roylet stands to lose a considerable sum of money in the event of his stepdaughter's marriage. Yes. There's some kind of trust fund which he administered only as long as the girls were unmarried. That fact was brought out at the coroner's inquest two years ago. But if Roylet did poison the other stepdaughter, and I'm thinking he did, it seems unlikely that he tried again. Two sudden deaths in the same household with the... Hardly past the coroner. No, 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 my dear Watson. You're making the mistake of putting your normal brain into Roylet's abnormal being. Oh, uh, that'll be Miss Stoner now. Yes, it's precisely 11 o'clock. Well, let's see what we can do for her. I hope you can help her, Holmes. She's an extremely nice girl. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? There's a Miss Helen Stoner to see you, sir. Oh. She says she has an appointment. Show her in, please, Mrs. Hudson. Aye, sir. Come in, my dear. Thank you. Oh, Miss Stoner, I'm, I'm so glad to see you again. Oh, how do you do, Dr. Watson? And this must be your friend. Yes, Miss Stoner, I am Sherlock Holmes. Sit down by the fire, won't you? Uh, yes, please sit down, dear. You're trembling with cold. It's not cold that makes me shiver. Tell me, Mr. Holmes, has my stepfather, Dr. Grimsby Roylet, been here? No, he hasn't. He saw me in the street. I dashed by him in a hansom cab, but he saw me. Our eyes met and he waved me to stop, but I came here as fast as I could. A very sensible move. Dr. Watson has already given me several hints as to your present problem as well as having refreshed my memory as to the circumstances of your sister's death. My problem is a simple enough one, Mr. Holmes. I'm... I'm waiting to be murdered. No, no, no. Um, please be a little more explicit, Mr. Stoner. Very well, Mr. Holmes. My fiancé is leaving for the Far East today. When he leaves, I shall be alone with my stepfather at Silk Moran. He plans to murder me just as he murdered my sister. Why you say that, Miss Stoner? Many strange things have happened recently. For instance, he's just moved me into the bedroom in which my sister died. What reason did he give for changing your room? That my old one needed repainting. It didn't need it, but Dr. Roylet did need to move me into that horrible room. And other things have happened. I've, I've heard the music again. Music? What music? My sister first heard it a few days before she died. I heard it myself on that dreadful night she breathed her last. I was on that terrible. Don't worry anymore, my dear. Don't worry. You have friends to help you now. Uh, look here. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? No. Oh, Very well, then. Now, this music, does it seem to come from inside the house or outside? Well, it, it's hard to say. It, it sounds so faint. What's it like? A sort of soft droning sound. Sounds like a flute or pipe? Yes. It, it reminds me of native music I heard during my childhood in India. The India, huh? Oh. There's one other thing that puzzles me, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's that? My sister's dying words. As she lay in my arms, she, she gasped out two words. What were they? Band and speckle. You remember that evidence from the inquest, don't you, Dr. Watson? Yes, yes, I do. I couldn't make her a joke. Oh. Damn, speckles. Music. Miss Stoner, do you sleep with your door and windows fastened? Yes, Mr. Holmes, but so did poor Violet. You didn't save her, though. What did you gather from your sister's dying illusion to a band? Uh, I mean, a speckled band. Well, sometimes I, I thought it was merely the wild talk of delirium. And sometimes that it referred to a band of people. Oh, yes. I remember that there were some gypsies in camp quite near us at the time of Violet's death. Gypsies, eh? Yes. It occurred to me that the spotted, gaily colored kerchief that so many of them wear over their heads might have suggested the unusual adjectives that my sister used. Mr. Turner, how long is it since you heard this strange music that you told us about? I heard it last night. Last night? 
Dr. Arce leaves today, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, Mr. Turner, I shall do everything I can to help you. If we were to come down to Stoke Moran today, would it be possible to see over your rooms without the knowledge of your stepfather? Uh, I think so. He told me this morning that he intended to take a late train home tonight. Splendid. Watch now for the timetable, old fellow, and look up the trains to Stoke Moran. Right, your host. Oh, that's my stepfather. I know it is. Oh, yes. Yes, there he is on the doorstep. Oh, Mr. Holmes, he's followed me. What shall I do if he finds me here? Don't worry, Mr. Turner. Please don't worry. There's a private exit through that room there. Watson will show you the way. Come along with me, my dear young lady. And you will come down today, Mr. Holmes. Don't tell him, Mr. Turner. I'll telegraph you the time of our arrival. Goodbye and courage, my dear. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Come along, come along. Quickly, Mr. Turner. Karen? Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Attention, Mr. I told you he wouldn't see anyone without an appointment. Out of the way, woman. Don't you push me like that? I'm sorry, Mr. That's Holmes. all right, Mrs. Hudson. You can meet us. What kind of gentleman does he call himself pushing an old woman? So you're Sherlock Holmes. You have the advantage of me, sir. Your name is... My uh... name, sir, is Roylott. Dr. Grimsby Roylott of Stoke Moran. Oh, yes, yes. Charming place, I hear. Obviously, good for the lunch. You won't trifle with me if you know what's good for you. Ah, Watson, there you are. How was the, uh, uh, the experiment? Very successful, Holmes. Good day to you, Dr. Rollett. I haven't seen you since I gave evidence at your stepdaughter's inquest. Yes, yes, I remember you, Dr. Watson. Now listen to me, you two. My stepdaughter's been here. I faced her. What's she been saying to you? A little cold for the time of year, isn't it? You answer me. I hear the crocuses promise well. You dare to try and put me off, do you? I know you, you scoundrel. The Holmes, the meddler. Who am I? Holmes, the busybody. I believe that a man should occupy his time. Holmes, the Scotland Yard jack in office. When you go out, close the door, won't you? There's a draft. I'll go when I've had my way. Keep your nose out of my affairs, do you hear? Oh, yes, my hearing is excellent, thank you. And your diction and delivery most forceful. But time flies, my dear doctor. Time flies, and life has its duties as well as its pleasures. Can you bow them to rascal? Here. See this poker? Oh, the fire doesn't need cooking, thank you, doctor, please. But I should be obliged if you put some more coal on for me. You laugh at me. You don't know my speech. Look. There. Your poker's been double. And that's what I'll do to both of you. Don't keep out of my affairs. Oh, dear. I had a presentment that he slammed the door. He's an ugly customer. Literally as well as figuratively. Watson, I'd be much obliged if you get your revolver. It may prove to be an excellent argument to the gentleman who twists iron pokers into knots. The fellow's amazingly strong. Well, look at it. Well, I, uh, I don't want to appear flamboyant, but... Ah, there we are. Great. Scott Holmes, you straightened the poker out again. Yes, it was utterly useless in its former shape. And now, Watson, that timetable will catch the next fast train for Stoke Moran. Oh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm so relieved that you've come. But don't you think my stepfather might have followed you down here? You have to take that chance, Miss Turner. A few hours delay might mean a difference between your life and death. It's imperative that we examine this bedroom of yours before Dr. Rollett's return. Anyway, my dear, you mustn't worry any more. We're here in your house. We're going to take good care that no harm befalls you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. This is the room in which your sister died, is it? As much as I pictured it. Dr. Rollett's room adjoins this one, you say, Miss Turner? Yes, Doctor, on that side. The room which adjoins on the other side is my regular bedroom. Now, the one's being so convenient to paint today. Eh? Well, let's examine this room. Huh? No trap doors or sliding panels, I suppose. Sounds solid enough, Holmes. Yes, I think it is. Mara, what's this? Are you aware that this bed is cramped to the floor, Miss Stoner? Why, I know, Mr. Holmes. I didn't know that. Well, was the bed in your other room anchored also? No, I don't think it was. Very illuminating. And this bell pull hanging against the wall above your bed. Oh, that, it, it doesn't work. Well, but if you, if you want to ring. There's another one on the other wall over there. Then uh, why this one? I, I don't know. My stepfather made a number of changes after he came here. Yes, what a perspective in the apartment there. And, uh, it took some strange shape. Oh, why are you standing on the bed, Holmes? I'm curious, old fellow. Uh-huh. It may interest you to know that this bell rope is fastened from a brass hook. There's no wire attachment. It's a dummy. A dummy? With wire? There's a small screen above it. It's a ventilator, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Yes. A ventilator leading into your stepfather's room. Curious. I noticed there's no means of opening the ventilator on this side. It can only be operated from your stepfather's room next door. 
I wonder if you might mind taking us in there. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Follow me. Thank you. What do you make of it, old Holmes? There's devil's work afoot, old chap. Here we are, Miss Holmes. That's the same as the other room. A bit bigger, perhaps. That large set against the wall seems to be an unusual piece of bedroom furniture. What is it, Miss Donna? My stepfather's business papers. Really. You've seen inside it, then? Only once, some years ago. I remember that it was full of documents. What's the sort of note doing on the top of it? Does Dr. Rollett keep a cat? No, but he does have a cheetah and a baboon as pets. He brought them with him from India. Well, Holmes, a cheetah is just a big cat. That's true, my dear fellow, but I doubt if a saucer of milk would go very far in satisfying the appetite of a cheetah. Well, I think I've seen enough. This matter is too serious for hesitation in your life. They depend upon your following my instructions, Miss Stoner. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Holmes, anything. Is that the village inn I see through the trees from this window? Yes, the Queen's Arms. Your bedroom windows would be visible from there? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Very well, then. Watson and I will go there now and obtain accommodation. When your stepfather returns, you must confine yourself to your room on the pretense of a headache. You follow me? Perfect. When Dr. Rollier retires for the night, you must open your bedroom window and put your lamp on the sill as a signal to us at the inn. Then withdraw quietly to your usual bedroom and the one that's been painted. I'm sure that you can manage that for one night. Of course. But what will you do? When we get your signal, Dr. Watson and I will come here and spend the night in your dead sister's room. We are going to solve this mystery of the dummy bell pull, the unusual ventilator, and the strange music in the night. You'll hear the remainder of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to point out that at any really important dinner, you know, like when diplomats get together, you'll find wine on the table. Because for years it's been a known fact that good wine makes good food taste better. Prove that to yourself tomorrow night by having your dinner together with a glass of Petri wine. If you prefer a red wine for any meat or meat dish, try a Petri California Burgundy. That rich, hearty red Petri Burgundy is really out of this world. Now, if you'd rather have a subtle, intriguing white wine, let's say to go with chicken or fish, then try Petri California Sauterne. But so turn or burgundy to make sure it's good. Make sure it's Petri, won't you? Well, Doctor, it's a rattling good story so far. What happened next? You went to the local inn, I guess, and waited for that lantern to appear in the bedroom window at Dr. Royal's house? That's right, Mr. Bartell. We had an early dinner at the Queen's Arms, and then the car draw upstairs bedroom and sat side by side, puffing away at our pipes, our eyes straining through the darkness that telltale lantern to give us the signal that there was dangerous work ahead of us. As we sat there discussing the various aspects of the case, I remember that Holmes was very concerned about my own safety. I really have scruples about taking you with the night. It's a dangerous business. What about that poor girl alone in the house with that fiend, Roylet? I can handle the case by myself, old chap. I'm coming with you, Holmes. Speak of danger. There isn't a seen more in those rooms than was visible to me. No, but possibly I've deduced a little more. I imagine that you saw all that I did. I saw nothing remarkable except the bell rope. And what purpose that could answer, I confess, is more than I can imagine. It's all the ventilator, too. Yes, I don't think it's such an unusual thing to have an opening between two rooms. So small that a mouse could hardly pass through it. Oh, but at least you will admit that there is a curious sequence of coincidences. A ventilator is constructed, a bell cord is hung from it, a lady sleeps in a bed directly below the ventilator, a bed that is anchored to the floor. The lady dies. You see what you're driving at, Holmes. Look, 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 look. There's a lantern in Miss Turner's window. That's our signal, all right. Come on, Watson. Our night's vigil begins. All night. All night for a foul business, Watson. Come on. Through these lateral bushes. It's only another 50 yards to the house. The lantern's still burning away in the bedroom window. Yes, and all the other lights are out. Including the one in Dr. Ryland's room. He must have gone to sleep. To bed, possibly, Watson, but not, I think, to sleep. Great heavens, Holmes. Look! Look at that frightful creature leaping about in the moonlight. It looks like some hideous child. Dr. Rollett's pet baboon. Looks possibly human. Yes. Probably a great deal more so than its master. Let me get a little over the door now. This ivy provides the most convenient ladder. I'll go up first. Come on, Captain. I don't think it's strong enough to hold us both. Oh, we look pretty stupid. Setting our backs in the mud. 
Bart. Give, give me a hand, Holmes, will you? I can't quite get my leg over, over this window there. Yes, you are. Ah, thank you. Move it, George. Close the shutters. Exactly the same as it did this afternoon. This sound will be taken to our plans. Keep the lamp covered. So that if the ventilator is open, we can drop the wall each room. No light will show. Follow me here, you understand? That's it. Oh, why are you carrying that sticker? Prepared for a visitor. And I expect all the night is over. The visitor who will herald his entrance with faint music from an Indian pipe. You mean the music? Signal? That's right. Signal to an accomplice who can enter a room of locked doors. An accomplice who kills and leaves no trace. You mean the touch? No more talking, Watson. No more talking. Watson, on the edge of the bed here. You sit in that chair. We have a barber ready in case you should need it. That's your house. Have a lantern ready, too. When I shout now, turn the light. Pull on the top of the bell rope. You understand? Perfect. Good. Now we must wait. Perhaps for some time. But don't go to sleep, old fellow. Don't go to sleep. Your very life may depend on it. of the gypsies, Miss Stoner, the use of the word damned, was in an entirely wrong sense. However, when we examined the fatal room, I drew, drew the obvious conclusion. You mean the dummy bell rope, the mm -hmm. ventilator, and the movable bed? That's right, old fellow. It instantly gave rise to the suspicion that the rope was there as a bridge for something coming through the ventilator and uh, traveling on down to the bed. I once thought of a snake. I saw the saucer of milk on top of the safe. Well... My suspicions crystallized into certainty. English plot. English. Yes, an extremely clever one. Exactly. My stepfather must have claimed the snake to return to him when he played the music. Yes. He put it through the ventilator with his certainty that it would crawl down the rope and land on the bed. It might or might not bite the occupant. Perhaps she might escape every night for a week, but, uh, oh well, 
Sooner or later, she must fall a victim. Thank heaven I came to you, Mr. Holmes. Amen to that, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes, if you hadn't lashed the stake with your stick, I bet it wouldn't have turned back on its master. That's true, old chap. That way, I'm no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimsby Rollett's death. <laughs> but I can't say it's a fact that's likely to weigh too heavily on my conscience. Well, Doctor, that was quite a fascinating story. You know something? I- I'm not exactly a coward, but... No kidding. My toes really curl when I get mixed up with snake. <laughs> well, let alone in that respect, Mr. Bartell. I must admit that I like to have a revolver and at least 20 feet between me and any snake that wants to cross my path. Well, if you want a revolver in 20 feet, I'll take a cannon in 20 miles. <laughs> of course, if you're a wine expert, Mr. Bartell, and not a detective. <laughs> you wouldn't, uh, we say, find detecting much all right. We certainly shall say it. And incidentally, I'm not a wine expert, Doctor. All I know about wine is that it either tastes good or it doesn't. And I also know that Petri wine always tastes good. The Petri family sees to that. The name Petri on the label is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. And they know how to make it good. Because they've been making fine wine for generations. Handing down from father to son, from father to son, every secret, every skill of the winemaker's art. Yes, the Petri family took time to bring you good wine. That's why no matter what type of wine you wish, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I think I'll tell you an adventure that took place at a gambling casino in the south of France. A strange story of sudden tragedy and death. I call it The Adventure of the Double Zero. Sounds swell. We'll all be listening. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Bartow. Before I go, I want to say that every one of our friends bought war bonds to help our boys win the war. Now let's all buy victory bonds to help bring them back home again. Yes, and let's buy victory bonds to make sure that the men were wounded and that the finest possible pair. Those same victory bonds will help make the G.I. Bill of Rights. And they'll help provide for the families of those men who gave everything, including their lives. The men of our armed forces finished their job. Now let's finish ours. Bye, Victor Bond. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is an adaptation of the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Speckled Band. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>